Well, let's talk about the plant. How okay. did you come into that whole situation? It's a it's an interesting story, actually. I, I came up to the uh, my wife uh, at that time has since passed away. She was a girl who grew up in Concord. And so she wanted to live in the Bay Area. And we were down in I met her in L.A. and we had been together for a number of years. I think at the time. Let's see, we, we'd been together about 12, 14 years. And she said, look, I, I we got to we got to leave L.A. We got to move up there. I said, well. It took me 15 years to get established here in L.A., and I'm doing great. I don't want to leave L.A. And not only that, my parents were pretty old, and they lived down there. I, I, I really wasn't excited about moving to the Bay Area, but it, was, it, it, it began to feel like it was a choice between getting a divorce and breaking up my family life. I have two children, so, you know, wife and two kids or moving and starting all over again. So I decided, well, I'm gonna keep my family together. And I moved and I had no job or anything. I, I, I moved up here, I sold my Hollywood studio, my third studio, which was called Hollywood Central. And I decided, well, I don't know anybody in the Bay Area, so I'll go to all the studios and see if I can maybe find something to do or maybe somebody would like me to run their studio or something. So I went and visited everybody who was in the business. And the guy that was running Fantasy at the time was uh, Roy Siegel. Hmm. And I went to see him and I said, uh, I'm moving up here and uh, maybe you've got some work for a pretty experienced engineer. And they said, oh yeah, Arnie Frager, I've heard of you. He says, you, you do this, he knew a lot about me actually. And, and I said, yeah, I, I'm gonna come up and I know you do a lot of jazz records here at Fantasy. And he said, well, you better stay in LA because I don't have any work for you. And uh, there isn't any work for you, independent engineers up here. So I think you, you shouldn't move up here. Hmm. And so, I was kind of offended by that I would I, because he was an L.A. He was a New York guy who moved out to the Bay Area and made a made a success out of his career as an engineer. He was running this pretty substantial facility that did film mixing as well as uh, records. It had three or four studios. So I went around town and visited everybody else. And when I met the guy that owned the plant, uh, he had bought it with money he borrowed. So he was deep in the hole already on day one. And because the government had seized the studio in a, in a drug seizure and, and padlocked it, no bands had been there for almost two years. The, the, the US government had owned the plant for 18 months. And during the time they owned it, even though they kept it open and they kept the staff and they paid them, None of the none of the bands were going to go there because you know this was the sex, drugs, and rock and roll palace, right? And nobody was going to go there when the government owned it. No. So Bob had bought it, and he was in real he was in real financial trouble. And I decided, I think the guys at Fantasy they just they're never going to make anything available for me. They don't even they don't even think there's any point in me moving here. So I think what I'll do is. I'll go to my a and guys in LA and I'll say, I want you to bring this project up to the plant and I'll do it. And so I started bringing Bob business. And after about three months, he said to me one day, he said, you know, you seem to be really good at bringing, you brought me like major projects, two or three. And I renegotiated, he had a deal with Bruce Cohn who managed the Doobie Brothers. The Doobie Brothers had a, a album budget from Capitol a major label and they were paying Bob $75 an hour. And I said, you're supposed to be getting 150 to 200 an hour. You're getting 75 an hour. You can't survive on that. So I went out and talked to their manager. I said, Bruce, you know, you got to pay the plan 150 an hour, not, not 75 because you got a budget from capital. And I happen to know, I know the a &R guy over there. I know what your budget is. So if you don't pay these guys a decent, hourly rate next time you you the doobie brothers go to make a record they ain't going to be there 
And believe it or not, Bruce was a reasonable guy, and he actually started paying Bob a good rate. So after about three or four months of me bringing in a lot of business to the plant, uh, Bob offered me to become a 50-50 partner. So that answers the question of how did I get involved? I started by just helping the guy. I had I had no plans to own the plant. Uh, I had no plans when I took the lease on Venice Beach to ever be a recording engineer or studio owner either. <laughs> I but think my I think my whole happened. career was just a bunch of flukes, actually. Right. <laughs> so, uh, how long did you know? Did you run the plant as as you know? As a studio, from the 20. moment you took you took fifty fifty partnership. I was a fifty fifty partner in September first, nineteen eighty eight. That's when I took over. I told Bob, I said, "Look, Bob, uh, I have a business background in sales and marketing, so you got to let me run the business. You can uh, deal with the technical uh, support and whatever, but let me run the business." Even though I'm, I'm, you're, you own 51%, I own 49%. Let me run the business. I'll turn it around. And, I, and that's what happened. I ran the business. We turned it around. And then in 1993, I bought Bob's interest out. He left to become an uh, acoustician. Hmm. And I took over the whole business by myself in 1993. So I, I started in 1988. And we closed the studio because the business just completely died yeah. in, two, in 2000, April 2008. So I owned it for 20 years. And what was the highlight of, if you can think back of that period of time and say, I remember this period of time as the, the, the golden times, the, the best times. What were those times? The 90s. Uh, in the 90s, I had taken over in 88. The place was within a week of going under, literally going under. And it was very hard for me to see how to turn it around because for one thing, it was scary for me. I was a new kid in town. Everybody in town knew the plan. Everybody was watching what's going to happen there after the government had shut it down. Um, so I had to hit the ground kind of running. And the first thing I did was I rebuilt uh, the control room in Studio A and put in a solid state logic uh, G plus mixing board. Mm -hmm. At that time, which was 1989, that was a very big deal. It, you, if you didn't have an SSL, you didn't have a studio. As far as the top mixers were concerned, because the, the SSL G series were the first mixing boards that automation really worked reliably. You could count on it working. And a compressor on every channel was a big deal. Oh, yeah. Especially for rock and roll engineers who like to squash everything. <laughs> so I put in an SSL. Uh, it cost me I, some 15 grand a month for that mixing board on, on a lease. And, you know, to be honest with you, over the years I owned studios, which is 36 years I owned them. I thought I was working for the landlords, the leasing companies, and the employees because I never paid myself six figures ever. I mean, I barely made a living. Yeah. I made a living. I supported a wife and two kids, but I never got what you'd call. I never came close to the living I made before I started building studios, selling computer systems. <laughs> I bet. But uh, the first thing I did when I built uh, the control room of A is I scored Walter Afanasiev, and he had just scored a production deal at Sony Music and was producing Mariah Carey. Mm. 